While eu tenoya sanakula quiansna tenachantla sahan ochomeo e wanaux titameo. Yoan hathan squalowin quinze quachnomia e natalnoch ta papa eakin. Greetings, everybody. My name is Sanakula, and my family comes from the village in the Squamish Nation known as Eslahan. Um, my um, part of my education and learning are Skohotmish Snechem, our Squamish language, uh, brought a really deep passion of mine for researching about the now extinct Salish woolly dogs. In this Woolly Wednesday series, I'll be sharing with you the research that I've been undertaking for the past year, the number of years, and we'll be looking at the perspective from the Salish communities, how our stories have been silenced and through the colonial narrative, the erasure of our traditions and our cultural significance to our ecosystem and landscape, um, that part of the Salish woolly dogs history has been uh, very much erased like many other aspects of our culture. So I invite you to come sit and listen and I hope you're able to learn a few new things and to hear um, indigenous history from an indigenous perspective. Chen Quinn Mentomi up. I thank you all. So my mother has really um, has really nurtured my my learning and my connection to our Squamish culture, as well as um, just by attending community events or being uh, uh, engaged in different things like ceremonies or uh, gathering our traditional knowledge keeping. Um, as well, we also would do it like different um, public events or looking at different uh, things like, so one of the first experiences that I was introduced to the Salish Early Dog was um, at the Museum of Anthropology. Um, so we had seen different photos showing different Salish communities. Um, and there's really a very small amount of um, photographs. Um, and so there are many different accounts from the Salish communities. So I, um, I want to also give respect and thanks and honor to all of our Salish communities who not only um, loved and care for them, but today that we collectively mourn um, and, and remember. Um, so in the Squamish language, the pot pot cane is how we would refer to the Salish woolly dogs. And the cane part at the end of its name is referring to its hide or its skin. And the pot pot is referring to the fluffiness. So it's explaining how um, the Salish woolly dog has got very um, fluffy, very fur, uh, like fuzzy wool or fur or hair. Mm -hmm. Um, so in this slide, I wanted to explain um, this relationship and it is demonstrated, although um, I don't have the artist's name, I do believe that this is from an anthropologist and it's not um, a painting from an Indigenous person who would be the artist creating it. Um, and so when we look at this photo, what we do take away is that we see um, weavers and it would be either within their their own longhouse or their own dwelling. Um, and when we see this, we're able to um, get that insight. Um, and it's supporting how many of our oral histories and many of our communities explain the relationship to the animals, to the Salish woolly dog. Um, and so these are the only animals, um, as far as my um, research and my, um, and my relationship to the explanation of the woolly dog is the only one that would be um, living and entering it all into the longhouses or the homes. So within many different Salish communities, there will be a variety of um, different dwellings. So for example, in interior Salish, you would have different styles of pit houses, for example. Um, and it just goes to show that many um, different areas are very um, in tune with the climate and with the relationship to being within the landscape um, that we have been since time memorial. Um, so I definitely want to, um, to um, just explain that it's not only um, the coastal, the coast Salish people, but many other um, Salish communities also had a, a deep connection as well. Um, and there are a number of other different um, animals that are, um, some are also dogs, but different animals that have um, either gone extinct or faced um, being endangered even up to today. Um, and that is definitely through, um, through our own human impact and how, um, how genocide and colonization does impact the ecosystem, 
the landscape and the people and our relationship to each other. Um, so we'll we'll go into quite a number of different um, aspects as we go along in our six week, uh, I guess you could call it a course or um, our different uh, sessions that we'll be sharing. Um, so these, um, there are also, I wanted to note, there are a little bit slight variations because this is a painting, it is not um, necessarily a photograph, but from my uh, imagery that I have found, they're quite uh, more of a small to medium sized um, dog. Um, and I do also want to note um, in terms of looking at it scientifically that all over the world, there is no genetic match um, to date. Um, so some of the uh, research that tried to prove or tried to hypothesize that these Salish woolly dogs were at, uh, actually in fact um, brought here or they came over um, on boats from different areas, whether in Asia, Japan, different parts of Europe. Um, it has been disproved and I'm very, um, very glad that that um, when there are times and when there's uh, appropriate moments that um, different aspects of science can actually be used to support um, the narrative and the, um, the factual um, oral histories that are shared by Indigenous people. So that's um, to give credit to how, um, how different ways of settlers can support um, Indigenous narrative and, and showing our own history through our own lens. Um, and that is to uh, support um, rather than uh, than to deeply question, or um, I often find that oral histories are accounted um, in a Western sense or in a colonial lens to say that um, the children's game of telephone tag, where things just get mumbled along the way as people hear it. Um, but I do, I do find it very important that um, within uh, within a lot of our Squamish histories, as well as other Indigenous communities. Um, often when, uh, whether it's different legends or different um, teachings about plants or about um, whichever the topic is that we're sharing and teaching intergenerationally about, often it's really, um, it's really important that you are able to capture all of the details. You cannot leave out um, any of the main um, reasons or the main um, goals about what you're sharing. Um, and so very often, um, we are not even allowed to share even one sentence about a topic if we're not very certain that we've done our research and we've been um, told by our elders or our knowledge shares that we are sharing it in the right way. Um, just when we are hearing those, um, I guess, um, doubts about indigenous knowledge that we do have a very specific uh, teaching in all of our communities that go along with oral storytelling. So today when we might have everything written down with notes, or other written on our phone or voice recordings. Um, we're not relying on practicing that focus with our memory. So when we think about how much work and detail, even if you're thinking about, you know, memorizing for a test or for something for work or school, just how hard that is to have that focus and that precision um, to have things memorized. So there is so much I can go on about for the importance of how intergenerational teaching is done through um, Salish or different Indigenous communities. Um, and even within, um, within weaving, there is so much storytelling that goes in with our colors, um, with the different designs. And so of course, also having um, different fibers and materials from the Salish woolly dog to mountain goat um, and to different materials that we'd be using from um, stinging nettle to, um, to fireweed and red or yellow cedar. Um, so there are so much in the details that explain who we are, what our beliefs are, and our relationships with not only our own community, but our relationships um, with our neighboring um, nations as well. Um, so by no means am I, um, am I I'm not uh, directly translating what my Squamish language is. I do want to note that as well. Um, but it does uh, support the imagery and the text, just to have that as a side note. Um, so we have different areas in which um, different Salish communities um, have oral histories or have been found. Um, so this is just a few of the, uh, of the um, communities that are highlighted. Um, there's different, um, this I have, um, 
uh, references for in another document, but showing uh, just exactly which um, regions are overlapping and which um, nations um, have their own relationship to the Salish woolly dogs. Um, and so, of course, many of the um, communities with different um, Salish and languages. Um, we have a lot of travel between our nations as well for ceremony, for traveling by canoe. And there is so much to say um, today when we have the Canada and US border, when you look at say, uh, Coast Salish, we have nothing to do with that border. These are all of our traditional territories in which um, we have all of our relatives and our neighboring nations. And um, this was far before um, borders were created. Um, and so we have many areas in which the Salish woolly dogs often would be going into small islands and that would be to prevent them from um, breeding with other breeds um, as well. Um, and so this is a photo and um, this woman is from the Suquamish people. So today that's, um, that is across the US border you're going by those terms. Um, but her um, woolly dog behind her is named uh, Jumbo. Um, and that was in 1912. So for the most part, um, the end of the 1800s is around the time of the full on decline. Um, and there's a lot to be said. Um, if you know much about Canadian history about um, Terra Nullius about how um, through that of colonization within indigenous landscapes, it was not no man's land. It was not just um, unused um, territory. It was people living here without polluting um, our lands and waters. We had people living here without damaging the ecosystem. And it was, I guess in the sense when you say no man's land is that we don't believe that we own the land um, because we believe that we are the caretakers of the land rather than imposing our ownership over the importance of the relationship um, to the ecosystem. Um, so I find it's just a very sweet photo and she's sitting um, in this beautiful, um, today we have very, very few old growth forests, what we consider today, but um, back then it would have been just the forest. That was just the landscape and that's very special as well. Um, and also, sorry to add the lady um, in the photo, her name was Mary Adam. Here it's showing um, different Squamish place names. So I wanted to really highlight um, within Stanley Park, um, this area, it would be referred to um, today as Second Beach. Um, but within, um, within the Squamish language, that would be referred to an area where you would be able to collect um, the diatomaceous earth. Um, and so this is a, a natural occurring uh, material and that would be used for cleaning out. So after you have sheared um, the Salish woolly dogs fur or after you've even done something like gathering um, the mountain goat wool um, deeper in the mountain areas, um, that this diatomaceous earth, um, even today you'd be able to buy it you know, at a health food store as food grade. Um, but the diatomaceous earth is used, in, as you can see in this photo, it's about like killing off bugs is often used today, or um, it's used to clean um, kind of those naturally occurring oils. Um, and it supports the process of cleaning um, the wool or the fur or the hair um, in preparation. Um, and that would be before and after, depending on, um, as well as the season for um, when we are shearing the, uh, the Salish woolly dogs hair. Um, and so there are um, actually multiple regions within the Squamish um, landscape and within the villages that have the naturally occurring um, diatomaceous earth. Um, so within different families who had weavers or had people who were, um, would be sharing the knowledge about um, shearing the fur or hair off, um, as well as working with um, processing it. So. Um, similar to how sheep today would be sheared say once a year or um, depending on which was the um, preferred or specialized way. Um, that is a little bit similar idea, although sheep are not from here. So today that had become more available um, of having uh, sheep's wool. Um, but just to know that there was no, um, when we look at why they don't exist today, why we're not still gathering them, it's not by choice. It's definitely um, just a small part of the narrative that is showing the, um, the colonial genocide um, and showing that 
relationship that um, Squamish, that many different Coast Salish and so many Indigenous peoples, it's only a small part of our history that um, it's also deeply impacted. Um, and so in this photo, it is a photo um, and it's showing a woman named Salacia. And so she was um, both from Squamish and Musqueam um, families. Um, and in this photo, it's showing how she would be um, uh, basically in Squamish, I was just explaining how the way that um, our different tools for processing wool, whether it was from um, the mountain goat wool or from the Salish woolly dogs, um, and even integrating um, things like um, the, um, the fireweed fluff, so it's the seeds. So um, around the end of the summertime, you'll also be finding different plants that will have um, fibers, so uh, different plants like cattail, um, fireweed, um, if you think about like cottonwood buds as well, those um, very kind of fluffy um, uh, fibers that go along with the seeds. Um, so this, um, yeah, this is demonstrating, but I don't have actually confirmation whether she specifically was working um, with um, sheep's wool or if it was mountain goat or if it contained um, woolly dog. Um, hair. So there is definitely a lot more um, details. Um, and I know that there are so many different institutions that um, in collections um, have different weavings and they have confirmed through DNA testing that it, it is with the Salish woolly dog hair. Um, and so in this photo, we can see um, um, so in Squamish, we refer to them as the stum hoth, um, and that's a very, um, I guess you could say like highly respected, um, it's a very special um, weaving. Um, and through, um, through this um, different designs, it does contain and share and pass on our knowledge and our um, oral histories and our different relationships of family ties um, within our communities. Um, and it would be explaining how we use um, the fireweed seeds, um, mountain goat wool, the Salish woolly dog hair, um, and we would be spinning the different fibers together, um, as well as different ways of dyeing um, using different plants um, and different techniques for uh, the different variety of colors that we were able to, um, to maintain as well. Um, so it's a very, it's very special um, to have these blankets. Um, and later on in this series, um, I have confirmed that we have actually the Museum of North Vancouver does have a, um, a weaving that contains the Salish woolly dog. So we'll be able to explore and I'm very excited um, for you all to uh, learn more later on in the series as well. Um, here we go. Um, so this is one of the photos and I believe that this one was taken uh, uh, in Vancouver Island. Um, and so, so many of the different communities, they had such a deep relationship. Um, and so it is very devastating um, near the ending of, um, of their lifespan, um, highly related to being um, another, another story of genocide. So today I often, um, I just want people to um, create that own, plant those seeds in your mind of um, even for myself, when I attended public school, um, we talked about Indigenous studies, I would sit back and I would listen. And I would know when I'm at, in my home community, when I'm in, um, when I'm in the Longhouse or I'm in a, a, a potlatch or I'm visiting different neighboring communities, I, I do not absolutely see um, the way that I've been described or our communities have been described as in a textbook that's told to um, children in public school or um, once I started going to university that's when they talk more about um, different aspects of critical thinking but um, I definitely found we're only now at the day and age where um, where um, like I don't know how to perfectly articulate it but the way that our um, indigenous histories are they really been hidden for so long and I do believe that it definitely was on purpose. Um, and so looking through um, your own education, um, just really questioning why do, um, let's say Canadian um, curriculum, it does not talk about aspects of genocide. All that for myself, all that I had heard, let's say in high school was something like we learned about the Iroquois and how we have 
um, democracy thanks to this indigenous um, practices and teachings and beliefs and then we just skim over and we have to go back to learning about uh, European history and so for myself um, many different times when we hear an anthropological perspective about Indigenous people, it really can often be misconstrued. Um, so one of the most prime examples I wanted to share about um, why it's very, very vital to have the Indigenous people share our teachings rather than us being talked about um, was when I was in high school and I believe it was a textbook or a worksheet or whichever um, material that we had been um, shared with that day was saying that um, the different um, processes of having uh, First Nations people having a potlatch was for a chief to show off how rich they were to the whole community. And I was completely shocked because as my childhood attending different potlatches and communities, I had never felt anyone boasting about themselves. Um, it's it's all about reciprocity and it's definitely not about um, showing that you're better or richer than anyone in the community by far. Um, so for me to um, just take that perspective into account when um, when an anthropologist is writing about a community, they might observe that someone giving away gifts is seeing that they're richer than everyone else, but that's definitely not anywhere near the attentions of what um, the community is um, intending to do. Um, so by that, if at the beginning of when colonization was beginning, if people looked into our eyes and if we were given respect and giving back the reciprocity that, um, that our very giving landscape and people um, and ecosystems have, we would be in a very, very different place today. I, and I strongly believe that. Um, so definitely looking at changing the way that we see things as being only for yourself, but rather looking at how are you supporting the growth for the future or how can you help? Um, like we wouldn't say we have sustainability in an indigenous language because all of our natural core beliefs are about being sustainable. We don't have to implicitly try to be sustainable when we're not taking more than we need or we take care um, of our animals. So, um, we look at um, this is another photo here um, and so um, just something for myself like I have two dogs uh, huskies I have um, I have children I'm a mother um, and so um, what I really found that was such a dramatically opposite um, and this is related to how an anthropologist uh, explains um, potlatches and then how if you right now or after the program did a Google search and looked up Salish Willie Dogs, even on the Canadian Encyclopedia, even in um, a majority of the different newspaper or um, academic journal, what you're most likely going to have an explanation of is explaining that the Salish Woolly Dog is extinct because one, there is an introduction of sheep's wool or um, Hudson's Bay blankets, it was much easier to purchase a blanket than to sit there shearing the dogs and, and, and processing the wool and weaving the wool to make a blanket. So that's where I need you all to stop that narrative. What I want you to all tell you back today is why do these systems of power explain something that's, that's really going against um, the community's um, lived history in in the in the in the in the text here. I'm explaining how um, the late Louis Miranda, who's from the Squamish Nation, explained in our records. Um, he was interviewed, and he explained if there was an emergency, women would grab their Salish woolly dog and then their children immediately right after. So I just made like I just love that as someone who is both a mom. I have fur babies. You know, I think it's um, like I would. I would die for my children, you know, there's nothing else before them, but I just found it almost like just, it's just, uh, I don't know, like ironic, I guess, that um, anthropologists will say that we just really gave up on, on our pets. We didn't really care because we'd rather purchase something. But when you look at um, our lived um, values and the way that our communities related to one another, we were not a monetary system, everything, we had was not about exploiting the forest. We did not exploit 
that was not part of our worldview. It was introduced to us. So definitely to um, look at an opinion that's saying um, that indigenous people would rather buy things. It's completely taking out so many facts that are, are actually a lived experience that through oppression, through genocide, through inflicting um, colonization and through um, inflicting um, a monetary system of purchasing things rather than um, having access to sustainably, quote unquote, sustainably gathering things that was naturally part of our chiach, our traditional laws and teachings was never overpick if we were picking salal or salmon berry. We know who are eating the berries, which are animals, birds, different kinds of bear species. Um, and so it's never part of our idea to go into an area that has berries or any kind of what you would call a resource. It was never the intention to go in, take every single berry and move on to the next spot to take out every single berry. Um, so it's definitely a huge um, perspective change. Um, so if you, whether you're Indigenous or whether you're not Indigenous from here, what your um, critical thinking will be going into the next time you read about um, Indigenous people, because there is always, um, there's always a, an agenda, there's always a different um, perspective or a bias. And so wondering, why are Indigenous people being framed in that sense? Did anybody stop and ask them what was happening? Um, what was being taken or lost in that, um, in that situation? So um, to show this close relationship of the Salish woolly dog um, and, um, and the women who were um, sharing the wool or the different families, it's just um, to me quite shocking when I ever have first read um, the what do you say? Like the different, the narratives that are shared through, um, through a colonial, uh, colonial lens. Um, I just think it's very sweet photos um, of family. Um, so this is a photo and it does show the um, archeological, I guess, dig showing uh, the bones. Um, and so I do actually have, I believe you're attending today, Angela and <laughs> Perry, um, but there, um, yeah, so Angela did contact me, I think this year or last year, um, but there are very few um, articles and resources or anything online that I personally have been drawn to because as I mentioned, there are so many um, factors that show the Salish people gave up. The Salish people stopped, let's say, bringing them to their islands so they wouldn't um, interbreed with other dog species. So there's very few, um, there's very few opportunities for uh, for different Salish communities to share our history. Um, and even if someone asked us, will it, will a little bit also be um, a little bit guarded? Are we gonna? be taken seriously if we share this information. So I'm also very glad that you're all here today to, um, to learn more. Um, sometimes it can be, um, for me, something I'm like, are people going to, you know, as Indigenous people, are we gonna be believed? Are we gonna be taken seriously? Are we gonna be given credit for sharing um, our lived history and our, our Indigenous knowledge? Um, and so this photo I found very, um, what it sparked in me was to have this um, this way of proving through DNA or genetic testing that there is no match of any other um, any canine any other kind of species um, because there were um, articles that tried to claim that the dog came from Japan like I mentioned different parts of Asia or Europe but it has also been proven that there is no match. There is no other dog that matches this. It did not originate from somewhere and come here. They have always lived here with us Salish people who we have also been here. So we do not have the land bridge theory. We are indigenous to here for over 20,000 years. We've been here before the ice age. So when we have um, the opportunity um, to be taken seriously, it's, it needs to be really, um, it needs to be supported more within institutions. It's only very slowly happening, very recently. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of you, I'm sure many of you may have either um, seen my memes or found me online or through 
uh, whichever online uh, social media platform. Um, but so when I was um, in 2018 in my Squamish language certificate, um, that is why I can write uh, full on sentences. I can converse now in the Squamish language is when um, is when I read the account um, from Lou Miranda talking about the Salish Woolly Dogs. Um, and it's also when um, I started on social media uh, sharing different, I created different memes. Um, so it's it's kind of silly, but it's still, um, it's very um, current and it's very, very real facts and knowledge. So um, I hope that you um, if you haven't, or if you have, hopefully you've enjoyed uh, seeing a few of my memes online, but um, even though it is, um, sometimes it's funny, sometimes I'm actually a little bit sad too, like I, I'll share ones and I'm like, oh, why am I, why am I sharing so many sad looking photos? It's because, well, deep down it is, it is a bit of a touching topic because they're not with us today. Um, and so, through different aspects of, um, of Indigenous knowledge sharing, there is humor, there is um, sadness, there is many different emotions that it will bring up. So um, I'm very, uh, very passionate, whether it's um, showing it in an academic sense or showing it um, within a museum setting or a formal place. Um, there's so many different um, areas in which I want uh, the Salish Woolly Dogs to be shared about, to be, um, to be given this acknowledgement. Um, and so for me, there is no curriculum built about teaching um, not only Salish children, but just the general public about the Salish woolly dog is because it has been quite a silenced um, topic for, for generations, for, for decades and decades. And so um, part of um, part of what I want to do is creating that accessibility about sharing about them. So thank you for, um, for joining um, and having the, um, the interest to come in today.